This episode is scripted, narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher, with script assistance by John Ruths. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 65, in which we will be analysing section 7 of the 1978 film, The Road and the Beanfield. Two bits of burrow keeping this week. Firstly, I have now started making earnest preparations for Site Visit 2, River Enborn to the Warren of the Snares. I'm in the process of contacting landowners, having actually properly established who owns the land I'll be entering this time, as I want to avoid trespassing. And things are looking good. Watch this space. Secondly, I've seen another lovely review of the podcast on Apple, which again just about sums up why I do this. It was by a listener called Zoe on the 22nd of May, and is titled A Very Rewarding Find. Quote, I only recently discovered this podcast and have been busily binging it over dog walks and car journeys. Having my own show on here since 2018, I feel a lot of empathy towards Newell as his project has progressed. Here and there, I've tried to pull in references to Watership Down as the 78 film and novel had such a profound impact on my growing up. I recall attempting to rewrite the story in numerous ways as a child, probably leading to influences over my adult writing. Thank you for your analysis, inspiration and research. It's simply wonderful to have a show that goes into so much detail over what must be considered one of the greatest examples of xenofiction in print or on screen. End quote. Thank you so much for those remarks, Zoe. They're really appreciated. So, on with the episode. Section 7. The Road and the Beanfield. This section covers from 18 minutes 30 to 21 minutes 20, and the equivalent chapters from the book are chapters 10, The Road and the Common, 9, The Crow and the Beanfield, and 11, Hard Going. And so, having crossed the Enborn, the eight rabbits head south, accompanied by the optimistic main theme of the film. In the book, this is where they find the beanfield and rest, after a frightening encounter with a crow. However, the filmmakers, for some reason, probably related to pacing, decided that they should encounter the road first, as a bit of comic relief. Does this constitute a crime against Watership Down, as detailed in episode 14? Well, bearing in mind that locations in the book are all real places, as my site visits will demonstrate, you could call it a misdemeanour, but perhaps not the most serious we'll enc- we will encounter. After all, a beanfield could be anywhere in relation to a road. As the theme plays, we see the rabbits heading towards a hedgerow, followed by a shot of them running among cows, almost playfully. The tone is very positive as they run through a gate and across a field towards the road. At this point, a tense tone enters the music, and we see Fiverr's face in detail in one of the best shots of him in the film, one that I think sums up his character very well. As he looks around, we hear Silver asking if anyone knows where they're going, and Violet expressing confidence in Hazel. While she is with us in this film, she almost acts as an alternative Pipkin, while Silver is ever the sceptic. The camera zooms in on Fiverr's troubled face for a moment. What is he sensing? It is a fascinating moment of visual storytelling, and I have put up an Instagram of this moment in the film just labelled Fiverr. And now we arrive at one of the scenes I clearly remember being most used to promote the film when it came out in 1978. The scene where Bigwig demonstrates how crududus are not dangerous. Ironically, this comic relief starts with the first dead body to appear in the main narrative of, of the film, a Yona, or hedgehog, who has been killed on the road. Bigwig explains Froodoo's and Rhodes to Hazel in a matter-of-fact way that does not seem like showing off. This is a summed-up version of the conversation from the book, which misses out the part about Rhodes only being dangerous at night due to headlights making you go tharm. And then Bigwig cannot resist showing off for a moment, which he does not do in the book, just sticking to the verge as a car passes. However, here, sitting out in the middle of the road, he sits calmly as a Land Rover with the registration MR767 drives west right past him. Luckily for Bigwig, the driver doesn't fancy an easy bit of rabbit killing that day. Neither, it seems, does the driver of a red sports car, registration WD3231C, who immediately speeds past in the opposite direction, causing Bigwig to panic and leap about the road in a circle, ending up on the other side. 
He just about manages to style out this moment as if he meant to end up there in exactly that manner, but we can see he didn't. It is truly the first cinematic moment of bigwig buffoonery, which, to be fair, are not that common in this film. With a flourish of light music, he comes back out into the road to tell the others to cross it quickly. As the clarinet theme returns, we see two layered background zoom shots, implying their onward progress. These musical interludes, in which the rabbits do not appear, are used several times in the film to symbolise progress in journeys. They are a reverse of the effect used in the opening titles as we symbolically journeyed from Watership Down back to Sandalford. And now we see the bean field for the first time, which lies in a field right by and north of the road in the book. Bigwig, acting as second in command, is heard telling Hazel they need to rest, and I should think so too. In this version, they haven't stopped once since the river, it seems. Hazel says that there is something up ahead and sniffs. This is greeted by sarcasm from Bigwig as he asks if it is a burrow. Hazel looks irritated but gives a straight answer. The beanfield will give good sight and sound cover for them as they rest. Shouldn't this phrase be sight and smell? As we see a beautiful layered panning shot across the tops of the beans, we hear Blackberry say that Hazel is beginning to sound like a chief. He uses the phrase Hazel Ra. And Bigwig's response is why I have counted chapter 11 of the book as being included in this section. For that is the chapter from later on in the story in which the lost paragraph is featured, in those editions in which it appears. But here there is no promise from Bigwig to stop fighting the day he calls Hazel a chief. Instead, it is a passing moment of unpleasantness, followed by another whimsical musical flourish and a symbolic shot of two butterflies interacting. And if, after the later Battle of Watership Down, Bigwig does call Hazel Ra, we never get to hear it. In the book, as they approach the beanfield, Pipkin and Five are emotionally exhausted after the journey through the woods and across the Enborn, and noticeably vulnerable, are attacked by a crow as they approach the beanfield. Hazel, Silver and particularly Bigwig drive it away in an early moment of standing up to a lil. But not here. The eight rabbits are next seen at rest among the beans. But now a bee buzzes by. And we last saw that as Fiverr discovered the notice board. In this film, certainly in its earlier section, the appearance of a bee seems to act as a harbinger of death. As it passes through the group, we see Violet, the only doe, seem to dose it, it and smell the air. She runs to the edge of the beans where Fiverr is sleeping significantly, for he exists on the margins in many ways. He notices her leave cover and seems immediately concerned, but he says nothing. And as he looks at her starting to feed on the white flowered plant she smelt, we see a shadow as an alarming musical theme plays. And then the hawk appears. We see the horror on Fiverr's face, but he raises no alarm. Then we see its talons close up, then a violent moan of screeching and blackness. In the next shot, we see the plant with a couple of small feathers floating in the air. The other rabbits join Fiverr, who just looks on and says, Violet's gone. It is a shocking moment, and one added to the narrative. In the book, not one rabbit who left Sandalford dies. Not one. But Violet the Doe was, it seems, an intruder here. She is not even credited among the cast at the end of the film. Her inclusion in the film, considering the nature of her departure, seems curiously disjointed to me. Hazel's only comment is, we'd better keep moving, which, though a moment of leadership, is telling. Violet, unlike Bigwig, gets no, my heart has joined the thousand, for my friends stopped running today. She just ends. And with the sound of a sad clarinet, that is that. Was her rank too low to earn this accolade, or just too female? Fiverr, the only rabbit who saw her die, or at least be carried off to be killed, hesitates for a moment. Then he leaves too. Comparison with the book. This is the section of the film in which summary of the book becomes divergence from the book. Of course, one has to make allowances for the pacing requirements of a film version of a book, which cannot just be made for fans of the original who just want to see it reproduced page for page on the screen. But my originalist half still feels regret for the departure from the geography of the book that happens here. And the death of Violet, while an effective cinematic moment, just seems a bit odd. 
Could it be a nod towards the casual death of the second doe in chapter 40 at the hands of a fox on the return from Ephrathah? Possibly. But for me, the way it is handled still jars a bit. It would have been worth building Violet up a bit more as a character if we are going to lose her in such a dramatic way, so for the character not to even be credited seems a shame. If this is because she is the only character invented for the film, which I believe she is, then that indirectly discriminates against the female actors involved in the project. Another reminder that this film was released 44 years ago. But, as ever, the beautiful animation of this section of the film inclines me towards forgiveness. Next time, the rabbits meet some rats and a stranger. Mm -hmm.